Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Quadcast listeners, Resource Optimization Network supporters, we are on webinar number five on COVID-19 topics, and I couldn't think of a better person to talk to us about grief and dying. And you'd be like, why are you talking about such a sober topic right now? And I was telling uh, some supporters a story about seeing my first patient pass away during the COVID era, and I, I literally could not believe it. I couldn't believe um, how tragic it was. It's like it's such a sad experience seeing that patient die alone and wanting the, the the loved ones to be able to come and be there for them and and that not having that capacity and talking about goals of care discussions with families in these in this in, during this time it's so challenging and so i wanted to make sure that we address these things and see how we can navigate through these things because it's not only difficult for families and and um uh, the patient, but it's also difficult on caregivers, yeah. uh, on healthcare teams. So, um, without further ado, I want to say hello and welcome to Heather Busada. Hello, Claudio. Hello. Thanks for having me. Always. <clears throat> So we go ahead. Oh yeah, I, that's I was giving you love already. Yeah. So do you? Okay, uh, that's it. That's yeah, awesome. no, that's it. Because you're gonna. Okay. Yeah. You, well, yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, I I think when you first called me though, Quad Joe, it was when it was all starting to come about, and I felt panicked because all like, all the rules and regulations and policy changes were coming in fast and strong, right? And we were trying to make sense of it all and and uh, everything that I was being told to do, which is appropriate given the COVID times around visitation and all that was counterintuitive to what I do in grief and mourning. So I was uh, perplexed and I was extremely perplexed. And I, at times at the beginning was like, oh my gosh, how are we going to do this? I'm not sure how to do this. So it, it, you certainly helped me to kind of think about it some more. Mm -hmm. And I certainly, um, uh, reached out to uh, my friend, my American friend, mentor, friend, teacher, uh, Dr. Alan Wolfelt, and to get a better sense of uh, a grief at world's grief expert on how do we go about grief and mourning in this COVID times. So I hope to talk today about kind of COVID in general um, and uh, ab about how any mourners out there going through grief at this time, the sense of loss we're all feeling, and as well as like with um, as healthcare providers, how we go about some of these challenges. And I think, you know what, this is all new to all of us, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's completely new to all of us. So we're all learning and we all have to be kind and gentle with ourselves and each other. So with that, I guess I can put on my slide here, eh, Claude Joe? Yeah, it sounds good, Heather. Awesome. Um, Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so we'll talk today about um, how to manage to the best of our abilities, this whole craziness with COVID and, and managing death and dying. Um, yeah, so there, I, I want to give special credit to Dr. Wolfelt there from the Center for Loss and Life Transition. Fantastic. I have slides at the very end that actually links to uh, some videos he has and some excellent uh, papers he's already pumped out in terms of COVID and mourning and grief. Um, so I, I want to give a special thanks because it's through our conversations and our emails and our discussions that I, I was able to do today. So thank you. Um, yeah, it's interesting. You know, we all call it this viral pandemic, but you know what? It really is a pandemic of grief. It, it absolutely is. Like there's I mean, there's not one person that hasn't been affected by this worldwide, like this is a global pandemic. Um, but universally, we're all being threatened. And, uh, you know, many thousands of people have died. 
and it continues on and people are losing loved ones. And not only that, but there's so much losses that are happening. The loss of social contact, the loss of friends and families that we're having. A lot of people have lost their jobs and income. Loss of special occasions, rites of passages. Uh, I know weddings, birthdays, that's all being postponed, delayed. I have a couple of nurses up on medicine who've had to, uh, a great amount of grief because they had some weddings planned and now that's been postponed. So it's a huge loss. We've all been affected. It's affected our rituals. It's affected our, our daily lives. Um, even something like my son's graduating 2020 high school. I've known a lot of these kids since they were little and, and now they're um, not able to, uh, an important passage to their graduation, right? So when you're talking about this kind of pandemic of grief though, and I don't know for some of you might've heard my first podcast with Quadro, I talked a lot about this, but it's hard to talk about grief and mourning without giving some um, some guidelines and some definitions around it because they are very somewhat different and and how we approach what what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, grief is that is that um, internal thoughts and feelings that we have. So whenever we have an attachment um, in life that are threatened, harmed, or severed, we feel that grief, right? That's our internal thoughts and feelings. So, so right now, a lot of people are going through a lot of shock, disbelief, disbelief, fear. You know, no one ever told me that grief felt so much like fear. Um, a lot of people are saying, you know, I'm waking up with this heaviness, um, this sense of uncertainty, right? That's, that's that grief feeling that you're, um, that you're encountering. So that feeling of sadness is an affirmation of that sense of loss and uncertainty we're feeling. That anticipatory grief, you know, of the future to come, our, our head and our hearts trying to figure out what does this all mean for our future. Uh, one of the concepts that um, Alan and Dr. Wolfelt had um, talked about, which I, I thought it really was wonderful and it, it spoke a lot to me, at this particular time during this pandemic of grief is we have, we're all experiencing this um, concept of liminal space. Um, it's it, the Latin root word of it is threshold. So we've been, we've, the, we're on this platform, this threshold where this, our, our old world isn't as it was, and we're not yet into the new world post COVID. So we're what we would call betwixt and between, right? So we're in this kind of strange um, time. We're in this weird pause, this suspension right now. And you know, in a crazy busy world that we are, a lot of us aren't comfortable with pauses and suspension, right? It's, it's time that we have to, it makes us uncomfortable because all of a sudden we have to think about what's happening and what's happening to ourselves and, and how, how, are, how is our life gonna unfold? And that's, that's very much what we feel in grief, right? The old world is no longer and the new world is yet to be. So how do we, how do we kind of go through this? Like how do we then take um, the steps to figure this out? What do we need to do? Uh, well, first all, off, we need, to, we need to recognize that this is, is a normal and natural reaction to everything that w that's going on right now. Uh, you know, people often think grief is something to be solved. Um, uh, it's a mental health issue and we need to solve it. But you know, it's it really grief is a presence. It's a presence in our psyche that needs witnessing. We need to bear witness it. We need to bear witness to ourselves in experiencing it. And more importantly, in the morning work that we need to do. And in that morning work, um, grief responds to um, attention, awareness and expression. So that emotions need motion. Uh, we need to feel it to heal it. Uh, we need to outwardly express ourselves in terms of what it is that we're feeling and experiencing. And, you know, a, a great saying for mourning is a shared response to loss, but even more so, it's grief's gone public, right? And what better time than this pandemic has grief gone public? Because remember, when we love somebody, we love somebody from the outside in, and when we grieve, we grieve from the inside out. So uh, we're all experiencing this right, right now. So in this pause, we can actually... Um, socially respond to this loss that we're all experiencing. Within that scope, um, there's this, uh, you know, there's, there's no stages per se when we're, we're dealing with grief and mourning, but um, how do we apply that to what I, what I know of grief and mourning and in the concept of, of COVID times? So this applies to whether you know you are actually experiencing the death of someone or just the general pandemic of grief that we're all experiencing as we adjust to the different losses that we've we've encountered. 
you know, morning need one is always essential. We need to acknowledge the reality. You know, often you need to acknowledge the reality of the loss. And for now, we need to acknowledge the reality of the pandemic of grief that we're experiencing. Um, that things have been threatened, harmed, and severed right now in our lives. And that, that's what uh, we're acknowledging. Uh, morning need number two, um, embrace the pain of the loss. This is really difficult. That's when we start to feel the multitude of feelings. Um, you know, grief, if, if we share our grief feelings, over time it softens. But it, where we get stuck, or where you might have some carried grief, or what we might call complicated grief, is that when we're not, we're not expressing it, we're not sharing it. And that's oftentimes when people get in, into difficulties later on. Um, and, and within that, you know, that kind of pain of, of what we're experiencing is that sense of relinquishing some of the control um, that we feel we have. You know, initially, for instance, when this was all happening, um, you know, we're all kind of paralyzed a little bit. Uh, I think that my um, director, social work director, coined it, uh, coined it quite nicely. She called it hypervigilance fatigue. We were all in this at the beginning, ready for a race, and I think we all realized this is more of a marathon, and we're quite exhausted from it, um, but we need to pace ourselves. Um, what can we have control over, though? Um, some of the things, we can't control everything that's going on out there, but you know, things that we can do, you know, washing our hands, staying six feet apart, uh, social isolation, you know, in trying to not go to the store as frequently. That, those are the things that we can remember that we control within ourselves and within our family. Um, a, a third need of mourning is, um, is remembering. It's, it's so important. Um, whether, you know, we're remembering the person who, the precious person that's passed away, but also within the development of this COVID of grief, uh, we need to have a sense of gratitude. And I know gratitude is a little bit of a contrite word. People are like, oh yeah, yeah, gratitude. Um, but you know, there's a lot of research behind gratitude. It's, it's um, even just if you do gratitude 15 minutes a day, it actually helps us. There's lots of science behind it too, right? So when we're having all these feelings, our limbic system goes in overdrive, right? So we're constantly being triggered by threats and danger. And that's, you know, that kind of fight or flight response that we're having. So what we need to do sometimes is get ourselves back online, um, you know, to that prefrontal cortex where um, there's future planning and emotional regulation. And, and 15 minutes a day, gratitude can do that. You know, I know when Kwaju asked me to do this, I got in panic mode <laughs> when I was sitting trying to just figure it all out. Uh, and it just took a few moments myself just to sit there and say, you know what, I have a roof over my head. Uh, my dog's at my feet. I've got the kids making me dinner tonight. And I get to go to a workplace that I love and enjoy and uh, try to figure this all out. So just those moments of gratitude are really important. Morning need number five. Uh, I never forget that grief, uh, it affects us to our very core. It's, it affects our sense of identity, our sense of meaning, our sense of safety and security. So, so how do we do that in these times right now? Well, I think Quadrana, you and I were talking a little bit before we went on air about that sense of being kind to ourselves. You know, always try to treat yourself as your own best friend. You know, what would you tell a best friend who is experiencing some of those stressors? Try to be patient and compassionate um, within ourselves. Uh, and you know, knowing that grief will affect us, these senses of losses and, and fear that we're experiencing, it's not just an emotional reaction, right? It's gonna affect us physically. Um, we're gonna feel more fatigued, less sleep, um, difficulty eating at times. Cognitively, uh, you know, uh, multitasking gets more challenging, we're more irritable. Um, those are things that are going to affect us socially. Well, that's already out there, social isolation. And spiritually, it's, it affects our sense of who are we in all of this as our identity starts to be switching, not just within ourselves, but in uh, towards all of us as a society, right? Um, and, I, you know, I've been talking with some of the um, internal medicine docs, and it's really hard on all the healthcare workers because you know, we know that these policies and regulations are in place for, you know, for a greater purpose because of the COVID and trying to flatten the curve and all of that. But we, we tend to be hard on ourselves. You know, as, as healthcare workers, um, we like to think, you know, to be the best we can be and be superheroes. But, you know, ultimately, we really are just superhuman. 
And to know that if we have really high expectations, particularly at this time, um, that there'll be this, there'll be a futility in that, right? When we start to freeze and the futility of that. So, you know, just to be as compassionate as we can, we're all going to be um, making mistakes and trying to figure it out. I know when I first started with the COVID and all these regulations around um, visitation, it was really hard because a lot of my work is, is done with families and encouraging them to be present and being part of the, the conversations around goals of care and, and sitting vigil and recognizing the dying process. I couldn't do that anymore, right? So I was having a hard time when it first started. I remember talking to one lady, it was an elderly lady, and she was losing her son. And uh, because of her age and ill health and whatnot, she wasn't able to come in. And it was just starting. I think it was the first time there was regulations around no visitor policy. I, I had a hard time. I, I, I wasn't sure what to say. I, I was struggling. And it was against the norm of what I normally talk to families about. So I, I did get off the phone. And, and thankfully, I was able to share that with my colleagues and um, reach out to people um, like Alan or, uh, you know, my palliative care team and other social workers to say, hey, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to attend to families and care for them with these changes? Um, and that's really important. Um, I actually got to talk to her later on, uh, just um, this past week. And I told her, I actually told her, I said, you know, when this all started, you're one of the first families I spoke to about you know, visitation and uh, we had a very open and honest conversation about how it was difficult for her and uh, what was helpful and what wasn't help for her, helpful for her at the time. So the, the morning need number five, um, that search for meaning. Uh, you know, we're in this liminal space right now and we're suspended. And it's often at these times that we have really kind of, you know, we can either find that as freezing time or a freeing time, right? It's an actually a great opportunity. One of the um, um, posters I have in my office, and I try to adhere to it as much as I can, but it's quite the mind and the soul will speak. Um, it's, it's in those silences and people often find the discomfort, but it's in those silences and those quiet times in our lives that we actually are able to go a little bit deeper. Do I mean soul to be spiritual, religious? Potentially, absolutely. You can't do really good spirit work without getting into the deeper soul work, but it's also just our intuition, our sense of who we are, our meaning, our values and our beliefs at this particular time. Uh, just to be more aware of it, to slow down, just to be present to that. Um, and this is we're doing on a global scale. How, how amazing is that? Uh, and here in the hospital, when there's some simple things I notice that to be able to do, to try to just kind of quiet the mind um, and just kind of be present to what's happening, to pay attention to how we're feeling and to what's, what's going on around us. Uh, and I've, in, in a simple form too, I, one of the palliative care doctors on our team is also an anesthesiologist. And she taught us a lot about, um, is it when we're putting on our per PPE or protective personal equipment, the donning and donning off, I think it is. Well, Jenny just told me what it's called and I forget already. Um, <laughs> uh, but it, she had taught us that you should actually have uh, a coworker, a partner to do that. So there's a list, there's a procedure, just step-by-step -step approach to putting on our equipment and how important that is. And so at those moments, there's just the two of you where you got each other's back, you're making sure each other is protected, you're, you're checking off the, the marks that you've, you've got everything down, you're okay, just take a moment to breathe, know you have each other's backs, you've got your fleet, feet planted on the floor, and remember the intentions of what you're doing. I, I've yet to meet a healthcare worker, even, even when we get burnt out and, and feeling really exhausted, that we're not there for altruistic reasons. We're, we're there to really be helpful. So just take that moment. As simple as donning and donning off our PPE um, is just to take that mind, just to quiet ourselves and to say, hey, I gotcha. And then when you're going into that room, you're going in together, you're going in a, a form of safety and security. And when you go in like that, for the poor person sitting in the rooms, COVID suspected or COVID 
um, who's isolated alone, seeing all this equipment on you, you're coming in with a different presence, right? You're coming with a different presence and that's gonna make a difference in terms of how you approach it and how the patient uh, responds to you. So it's just sometimes simple little things like that. You know, pay attention to the narrative that your, your narrative self-talk that you're, you're, you're going about your day. So those are moments that are really important. Um, and you know, the, the other one is morning need number six, reach out to others to accept and give support. And it's not just a one-time thing. We're trying to do that with our families as much as possible. We need to do it with each other. Uh, best, best thing is if you can be with somebody, but seeing that we can't, try to do uh, video type things. I've gotten to know Skype, Zoom, FaceTime, getting to know them, I'm not that technically savvy as Quadro knows. Um, some of my families are having good, <laughs> good laughs at me as I'm turning the camera the wrong way. And anyways, those are, that's, that's the next best thing for sure if you can't be there, there in person. And uh, uh, text, emails, uh, don't forget the age-old written letter is always wonderful. I, you know, I always try when I'm talking to families on the phone. Um, I'm going back in to see so and so. Is there anything you want me to tell him or her? And relaying that message. Those are really important forms of communication. But reach out. Talk openly and honestly with each other and, and within your home. Try to be compassionate, and empathetic with because uh, we're all slowing down. We're trying to speed up and do our best but we're also, our body and minds are, are starting to slow down. Remember, you know, grief is a lot about going backwards before going forwards. It's a lot about a hello before goodbye. So our minds and bodies are trying to do one thing and, and as healthcare workers, we're trying to do another, right? So pay attention to that. We're gonna globally change and we'll change as individuals. And the good news is if we name it, we work on some of the mourning, we can evolve and hopefully awakening in the important things in our lives. You know, I don't know how many times, whether it's at work or friends, um, when I get to do some of the social distance drinking on the driveways in our neighborhood, uh, everybody's saying, uh, you know, I was so busy before, with what? What was I so busy with, you know? And it's hopefully giving us a chance to, to look at what is important in our lives and, and making sure as it goes forward to provide that meaning again and maybe get rid of some of those things that are causing us more, that are more toxic or harmful to ourselves, paying attention to that. The other thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about that I was recognizing, I talked to you a little bit about this, Pajo, we okay? I feel like I'm talking all by myself. Yeah, here, no, but. you're flying. It's, this is beautiful. <laughs> you, this is beautiful. I'm just alone in this room. It's this total social isolation thing. As I mean, you should. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what I'm seeing is a lot of this uh, uh, disenfranchised grief. What, what is that? Well, it's a, a term coined by uh, Dr. Kandoka back in the 80s. Uh, what does it mean? It's the, it, it's the grief that occurs when the loss is not openly acknowledged, socially sanctioned, or publicly mourned. A good example of that is, um, well, not so much nowadays with really good mental health education and things like do it for Darren, but I think suicides, right? So when somebody's had a suicide in the family, um, it, there's often that sense of shame and, and anger, and people can't feel, people feel that they can't publicly mourn it. They've got to be private about it. Or um, in the 80s with the AIDS epidemic, you know, it was often hush-hushed around at that. Or you've been married for 30 years and have children and you divorce and you both remarry and your ex-husband dies and uh, people are wondering, well, why are you going to the funeral? You know, you're not part of that person's life. You're not feeling like you can publicly mourn. Um, but when very fact that you've had that attachment, that, that love with somebody, and that's really important. So sometimes people feel shamed into feeling that they shouldn't be able to mourn, that they don't have the right to mourn. So what do I mean by that at COVID times right now? Uh, I, I'm seeing that with patients uh, or families, especially, you know, whether it's pre or post death. Uh, a good example of that is uh, I did have a lady, because it's still business as usual here, right? It's not all COVID. People are still dying of end-stage dementia, end-stage heart disease, end-stage lung disease, cancer. We're, that's still happening in amongst the, the, the craziness of the COVID. So I did have a lady who during this time, her mom passed. And when I called her, uh, she, you know, first and foremost, she was like thanking us as frontline workers. 
And I was saying, oh, well, well, thank you very much. It's very nice of you to be so compassionate and considerate of other people. But, you know, I tried to bring it back to her mom again, who just passed away. And in that moment, again, she went back to, well, yeah, I know my mom. Well, she was in the room and I know you guys took good care of her. And she was, you know, really nearing her end of her life. But what about all those people in the retirement home that just died? And then she went on to say about all the news reports around, um, you know, the people in retirement homes and long-term care that were dying, uh, like 29 in one retirement home. And I, it occurred to me that she's not feeling safe enough that she, because of the sensationalization of this COVID, well, who am I to grieve my poor mom when all of this is going on? So I made note of that, and I, I'm trying to make note of that with other families when I speak to. I just I brought it back down to her mom. I said, you know, again, I said, it's very kind of you to be so considerate, but, you know, right now you need to pay attention to that loss of your mom because that loss is really important. You had, and I know she had a, she had a very special bond with her mom. I said, you can deal with all that stuff out there that's going on at, at some point for sure, but for now you need to go back and remember your mom because you, you did have a really important and special relationship. And at that time, she started to get more teary. She started to talk more about her mom then. So you need to provide that kind of, you need to ensure the griever feels safe and validated and then acknowledged in their right to mourn during this time. Because sometimes in the bigger hype of things, when uh, family members passed away in a very gentle kind of way, it's hard to say, oh, well, you know, my mom just died. Oh, yeah, well, you know, a hundred people died over here. So not to not to take away from that, that um, that validation and encouragement to mourn who they've lost. Um, in the words of David Kiesler, um, what's the worst kind of loss? It's always, the worst loss is always, always your loss. Absolutely, 100%. Um, you, can you sit in a room and compare different um, loss, grief stories and death stories? Absolutely, and some need special attention. But always remember that when somebody ha has had somebody um, die, that that loss is the worst loss for them. And they need to, when we get a loss, we get in our own little grief bubble and we need to be, pay attention to that. Um, and even to go back to that kind of pandemic of grief right now for all of us, is as simple, something as simple as like my son missing graduation, in the grand scheme of what's happening, is that really a big deal? Well, not in the grand scheme, but is it a big deal to those kids who probably the first time they've really had a loss? Um, yeah, it is. It is. So it's important to validate that and allow them the opportunity to say that it's okay to grieve it. It's okay to be frustrated and sad by that. Um, so again, the worst loss is always your loss. That's really important. Yeah, so there's two more points. How are we doing for time, Quadjo? Doing, you're doing perfect. Heather. Okay. All right. I've got two areas I really wanted to talk about that um, I've also wanted to make note of during um, this COVID time around death and mourning um, is the area of funerals and ceremonies. Um, well, we all know that the, the most of the time they have to be postponed right now um, because of the COVID. Uh, a lot of the funeral homes are doing a fantastic job, and I know they'll to have, you know, I just talked to Kelly's a couple of weeks ago, Kelly's funeral, and, you know, they have, I think, five to ten people that socially distance, but um, it makes it more difficult, and a lot of people are postponing um, the ceremony of funerals, which is fine, which needs to be done, but I want to make note that don't underestimate funerals, how essential it is. Funerals gives us something to do when we don't know what to do. Uh, it's, it's an essential component of our healing. It's a rite of passage. So a lot of people think that funerals are, you know, they're there for closure. It's actually the opposite. Funerals are there to, to promote, to um, encourage our mourning, to open up our mourning. It's a, it's a time when we can actually say, you know, the reality of what's happening is occurring. So how do they help? How do the funerals help? Well, it, again, it acknowledges the reality of the death, a very important first step. It's an opportunity for us to express our grief, a shared social response to loss, a great time to share memories. And remember, uh, grieving is one about moving from, or mourning is one about moving from physical presence to one of memory. 
right? It's that shift that's so important. And we're not able to do that a lot in the hospitals anymore, for example, or, um, or even some of the palliative care facilities as we, you know, bear witness to a person in their end stages of life can always be there. So funeral is a great way to acknowledge um, that physical presence to one in memory. Um, and, you know, make sure that the, the guest of honor is there, you know, to remember that person. Um, it provides a grand, great sense of meaning and honor, absolutely. And I'd like to encourage that. I know people are, are having to postpone funerals, um, but remember at the point of, of the death, that's when your sadness is, is very strong. So if, even if you do need to postpone it, I would strongly encourage people um, to have something at that time, if you can. So we, we can't often meet in person, um, but we can do things like, uh, you know, seven o'clock tonight, well, let's all meet on Zoom, have a story about Aunt Mary that we all wanna talk about, um, or, you know, you don't feel comfortable sharing a story, light a candle in her honor. Something to do that there's a sh social response to it, because I, I worry that people are just going to leave that time and say, oh, well, I'll do it later, and then that later never comes along. When I saw, I saw people in grief counseling, it wasn't typical that they'd come to see me because they went to a funeral and was upset. They would come to me because they weren't allowed or able to go to a funeral or didn't have one. I had a gentleman who uh, had lost his mom when he was young, and he wasn't allowed to go to a funeral. And it wasn't until later on in life that he realized he was, had that carried grief with him. So we talked a lot about ceremony and, and brought back some of that um, time that he needed to honor, that he wasn't able to do that while he was a young child. So it's never too late, but I would really encourage people to do it at the time as much as they can. Um, you know, and again, I think, I don't know if you mentioned this earlier, it was a conversation we had in private, Quadro, but... Mm. Um, a lot of people aren't able to be there at the time of the death, right? Um, because of COVID. And that's exceptionally hard. Uh, it's, it's a moral distress for us as healthcare workers, and it's especially hard on families and, and the patient for sure, absolutely. Um, but I think palliative care is really good and, and what we try to do, we've always done this. We always give what I would call warning shots is that when we're talking to families or to remember ourselves, if we're a family out there, a member out there listening, um, that you know, people tend to die when we aren't in the room. So you could be there 24 hours a day and it's that time you have a cup of coffee or go home to change your clothes, um, that, that loved one passes away. And it's very common with, um, with our parents. So as adult children, our, our parents tend to pass when we're not there. Can we study that? Not really. Do I have my own theories around it? Yeah, for sure. Um, but I, I give that to people. and We tend to give that warning shot because people carry this huge burden on their shoulders about whether they were there or not at the time that person took their last breath. And, and yeah, it, would it be nice if you're there and it's important to you for sure. Um, but to remember that the life and that special relationship you had with that person is what matters. It's not necessarily at the moment of death. It's the relationship, and that's the morning work that, that you will go on to, to remember. So the more we can talk to people about that, the more important that is. And just to try to relieve some of that guilt and that, that burden families are having around that. Make sense so far there, Quadjo? Yeah, I was, I was, was just going to mention, too, like what you described in pre-COVID times like how many times we've seen you know there's 43 people in the room uh, everyone wants to support mom as she passes and that one moment where she's alone that's when that moment happens and uh, you know there's a lot of palliative care people I see on the on the webinar and I, I'm sure they'll echo the same thing it's incredible it's uh, um, once again hard to know why exactly that happens but definitely see that yeah yeah and, and especially now with people not being able to come in how important it is to to share that information with people um really so um yeah so i can't i can't say enough about funerals how important they are um and to 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 remember and honor the person 
do what we can at this time. And, and if you have to postpone it, try to have something down the road if you can, for sure. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about, and this is within our time frame, Claude Joe. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is, is fostering hope. Uh, Alan wolfelt has got a, I put it again at the end, he's got a great YouTube um, on this topic as well as, as an article. Um, but I, I really like it because, you know, people often think, you know, grief and palliative care, well, how depressing is that? Well, well, it's not. So, you know, that there's no hope it must be dark and despairing but actually you know when you're going down to meet somebody in that kind of deep darkness that they're experiencing when they have a, a significant loss um you're going to join them right you're joining them empathetically and more importantly from compassion from heart to heart um you know you're going to allow them to teach you what it is that they're experiencing the loss that they're feeling um, but to go down to that deep dark spot for some with somebody you, you can't go without a flashlight. Somebody's got to bring the flashlight. Otherwise, you're both going to get stuck down there. So there, you know, in that concept of grief and mourning is that element of hope. You know, we all have that divine spark. And when we're feeling that sense of loss or grief, that flame gets a little bit lower. And, uh, and, that's, and that's around that, that sense of what I'm talking about with, with hope. Um, life is always a balance of light and dark. You know, you can't really feel joy without having uh, know what deep sadness is. And, and you can't really feel deep sadness without understanding what joy is, right? Grief and love are the same flip side of the same coin. So, I mean, one expression is, um, you know, darkness is the seat that light sits on. You know, without, we can't have one without the other. And in any feeling, that sense of sadness that you're having or that fear, they're all authentic feelings. And when something is authentic, it's necessary and normal. It's, it's important to, to feel it and to express it. Um, but we have to be careful that we don't get so much despair that we become paralytic, that we just freeze and we, we can't mobilize from that. So we need to have this balance. And that's often where the hope comes in. Um, and it, what's great about hope is it, it is future thinking. So hope, it it's holds positive things. It's, um, it's trusting in that, um, that happiness is to come. There's positive things and happiness to come, you know, post-COVID kind of thing. That's where the hope is. But hope is interestingly very um, now focused. So even though it's future oriented, it's very much now focused in that kind of conceptualization of gratitude, right? And, and very much like um, mourning, it needs to be active. Our hope needs to be active. And how do we activate some of that hope? Um, is that sense of mindfulness, is that sense of grounding ourselves in our gratitude, um, remembering what is important, what gives us meaning, what gives us purpose. Uh, lots of things, you know, uh, my brother came by in his motorcycle the other day, social distancing, and got to see him. I get to have drinks with the neighbors on, you know, each side of the driveway. Uh, I get to come into work and share all this with great, amazing uh, colleagues and go through this. And uh, I think we all love to be part of this. And we're trying to join and help each other as much as we can. All that kind of hope around that. Uh, we, we need to relinquish some of that control that we feel that we have. Um, you know, we can't control what's happening around us, but we can consciously choose, we can consciously choose hope, right? And in that sense of, of what's going on, you know, be careful about the amount of stuff that you uh, listen to. You know, I used to come home after work uh, with the COVID and I listen to the news and what's happening. I've tried to let go of some of that just to kind of balance things a little bit. There's just so much that you can absorb at this particular time. And remember in all of that too is, is a really a key component is resiliency. Uh, we have it in each one of ourselves and to remember it within ourselves and to remember it within each other. Uh, a wonderful tactic to develop a resiliency uh, for say families who are struggling with the um, expected loss of somebody is, is some simple questions like, have you had loss before? What was that loss like for you? What was really difficult during that time that you lost so-and-so? What was really helpful for you at that time? How did you do it? How did you manage it? What would you like to carry forward from that time to this time to the present time? What can we do to either make it similar or make a difference for you? That's resiliency. That's, you know, we got it. We, we got it. We can do it. We can um, positively encourage that within each other. 
uh, building hope. You know, we build hope. Uh, you, you know, contact with others. It's a great way to do it. Uh, make future plans. Taking care of our minds and bodies. I, I think that's been so extra out there in the news and every, the media about taking care of ourselves. I think that message is getting really clear and loud to everybody. We're all kind of picking up on that. And I hopefully that can move forward as, as we uh, into our future. So taking care of our mind and our spirit, very, very important. And, you know, people often think that hope is something you have or you don't have. Well, it's, it's not. It's something you can choose. You can choose to have hope. And the great thing about hope is that if you don't, you might be out there listening going, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm not really feeling it. And especially, you know, if, you're, if you are in grief right now, you have that sense of anhedonia where you just, that joyful things in life just aren't giving you pleasure anymore and you really aren't enjoying things. The great thing about it is that you can borrow hope. Always borrow it. There's always that person out there in your life that you can reach out to. Um, I think of grievers, um, and, uh, you know, Alan's talked about this, and I've seen it in my own personal experience. Uh, when, you, when you lose somebody, when you've, you've had a significant loss, or even something like a divorce, or a death, or um, a loss of your home, or a loss of a job that you really identified with, you will find in your life you will have one-third of people that aren't so helpful. They might be the people... Uh, give by the grace of God, give them grace. And um, they mean not what they say, but they may say things like, oh, well, God only takes the good ones or, or um, there's lots of fish in the sea. You'll find another wife soon enough. Uh, that's the third you want to put over there. <laughs> and then you find a third of people in your life that, that aren't really especially harmful, but they're not really helpful, but they're kind. And it's, it's good to hear. It's that you know, the texting, oh, how are you? Hope you're doing okay. Let me know if you need anything. And then there's that one third, and it might just be that one person in your life that you know that when they reach out to you or you reach out to them, that they're the person that will come over or all through Skype or Zoom and have a cup of tea with you and say, how's it going? How are you doing? You know, really get to know how you are. And there's that little spark within them that you can find a little bit of hope. So choose it, choose it. And if you can, you can borrow it later. So that those are important concepts I thought within this COVID time, Quadjo, that I could kind of formulate and uh, trying to you know, make sense of all of this. Know if there's anything that you'd like to add in all of that. I mean, Heather, this is an incredible. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. I, I mean, there's so many things to cover. There's a couple of questions that we'll get to in a second, but um, just maybe a comment towards the the, the importance of con staying connected. Like, I think one thing that COVID has brought to us has been that ability to be more connected than ever in some ways because of social distancing. I don't know about you, but I've been talking to friends that I haven't talked to in a long time, Zooming, Skyping, uh, FaceTiming. And, um, you know, out of the, because obviously it's a really challenging time to experience in grief at this, at this point, but I feel like people are, are more willing to be connected than I can remember. Like, because we know what we're all up against and we know what, the challenges are ahead and I just, I feel like people are more open and, mm -hmm. um, and you could I, do it in your pajamas and you could do it in your pajamas. Exactly. <laughs> That's you know, awesome. The onesies or whatever. But, um, <laughs> yeah. And, um, so I think that was a great point too. Um, Maybe the other thing I, w uh, I was going to ask before getting to the panel question or some of the questions, actually, can you exit the, the yeah. presentation mode? Uh oh, yeah, yeah oh, we, did it. we did it. People that, people that <laughs> obviously don't know what's happened before. We practiced 48 <laughs> times before going to air. Can you imagine me with the family's trying to do this squad? <laughs> oh my God. Like, we practiced yesterday. Battle. We practice like, I mean, I get, just gave a presentation 30 minutes before and I was like, ah, but yeah, we're, we're on it. We're on it. Um, I was, I was going to say any practical tips for practicing gratitude. Like you mentioned a, a couple of things that, um, 
um, you know, that you've done for yourself, but any, any other things maybe over the top of that, that you, you recommend for us to, to, to be able well, to do no so. sense making it complicated. You know, I, you know, have gratitude that you get up every day and you try to, for those people staying at home and trying to juggle their work at home from home and the kids and the teachers and all of that, the gratitude that we're getting up every day and doing what we need to do. Wow. What an accomplishment that that in itself is an accomplishment. So it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be pretty. It just sometimes is taking note of, of, um, again, that, that amazingness and that resiliency that we have in each other as we try to grapple with these difficult times. So I wouldn't make it complicated. I would just, and that's the purpose of it, is the purpose of it is to just quiet the mind a little bit and just kind of reflect on really what is important right now. There's so much we can't control out there. Um, we can just take in the, it's a great opportunity just to be very mindful at the moment and think in the now right now. Mm -hmm. It's grounding. Yeah, great advice, Heather. Um, so our first question that we had was, does the approach to explaining to our kids grief during this pandemic change at all, in your opinion? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. it I, I don't know. Has that been on your topic before? Like the grief? No, thing? actually, that's a, that's a good topic. Well, that's a, that's a huge topic in itself. Um, but uh, I guess I guess my team they've heard enough of me say this. I, I can't. We don't have time to go into all the logistics about it, you know. But honesty is the first and foremost with kids. They'll pick up on, and if they if you don't tell them straight out, they're smart enough little dudes to be able to make up their own stories, and often their magical thinking will make it way worse. Um, but the three C's I always say with kids. Um, well, the funny part it is about one of them is that I usually tell kids when they have somebody dying is they can't catch it. Well, here they can. So be honest about it. Talk about it and give them ways that they can control it. You know, make sure that they know that um, that uh, um, that they didn't cause it. You know, kids are, are, are very egocentric in that sense and that, that things that happen in the world, they can't under they place it that it must have been something they've done. Right. So some shape or form, kids will uh, relate to something negative or difficult happening to themselves. Just make sure that they know that they didn't cause it. Try to have some open discussions around why that person has it and what happened and all of that. And the last one is continuity of care. Kids need to know that they're going to be cared for. Um, and so if they do have a sick family member, make sure that they know that their routines are as normal as possible. Everybody's routine screwed up right now, but the routines as normal as possible. And that, you know, let them know, even though so-and-so sick, these are the people in, the, in your lives right now. And these are the people that are going to take care of you and make sure you're safe and you're okay. Well, perfect. That was, that was great, Heather. Thank you for that. Um, we touched on this a bit, but we'll, we'll just maybe bring it up again. As has hospital staff, do you have a message to share with families who cannot be at the bedside? Well, there was a few points that I made through this presentation about not being at the bedside. Um, if, if you can, though, I, wow, the power of bringing, um, when I bring in the iPad to, to Skype or FaceTime with, with, uh, with patients, and I think my coworkers and social work can attest to this too. It's really powerful. It's the, it's even more precious because they know they can't come in. And when I actually connect them, it, they're just the tears of joy that they actually get to see the person. So uh, if there's any shape or form that you can, can connect a, a family to the person, if they can't come in really important, absolutely. And just, you know, little things like if I am talking to the family on the phone and I need to go back in or I can let the nurse know when she goes back in with all her PPE stuff. Um, what is it that you'd like to tell so-and-so what's important or vice versa? Um, try to stay connected as much as you can. I know the hospital has been great at making sure everybody has access to a phone with all the patients. Um, that's essential. Um, so that's, that's important. I love it. And I, I, I think too, with that whole iPad, um, concept it's like you have the technology it's such a simple measure Just put that the uh, ipad in front of the, the family member uh, i think it's a no-brainer 
And the other thing with the iPad too that I, I have yet to do, but I've, some of my colleagues have done is have goals of care discussions w- like with the iPad, you yeah. know, yeah. so that, um, you know, it's more of a connected conversation. Yeah. It's easier to build rapport that way too. Yeah, and I think that's been really hard on the families and what I've been hearing from the doctors as well is that um, it's hard for families to make goals of care decisions when they haven't seen the person. So you're telling them that this person, um, you know, it has a short life expectancy and the last time they saw them, they're up walking around. That makes it really difficult. So it's really important that you do be able to allow them to see the person so that they can see the changes and the reality of what's happening. Um, be, it becomes more realistic to them. Mm-hmm. And the re- uh, then that goals of care discussions can be more, um, uh, more based on what what's happening exactly um any other questions out in cyber world i'll give you a couple seconds um and i'll i'll say one more thing too just in terms of being there for each other i mean i i just finished doing a talk talking about how how i've never been never felt so close to my teammates before my career because you know you really feel like you have a purpose and and we're all in it together but I think it's really valuable to be there during the tough times too when you know it's sad seeing somebody die not surrounded by loved ones that's an it's an extra layer you know and so I you know I think it's important to have that check in with each other saying you know grandma Nelson passed alone there you know how you doing with this how how are you coping? This, that was pretty tragic, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, I like what you said, and it's important to to call it too because there's a lot of families feeling really guilty out there that they can't be there, and guilt, you know, it's a lot of work around guilt. It's a lot of, um, you know, how come and and why questions that takes a lot of time because you, you, you don't tell somebody not to feel guilty because then they just feel guilty about feeling guilty, right? But I, in some sense, it's almost to be paternalistic at this time and call the elephant in the room and say, you know what, I, I'm, this must be awful for you that you're not able to be in there with your loved one and our hearts go out to you terribly. Uh, this is such a hard time. And just really call it out and say, you know what, it, this, I know a lot of people out there are feeling guilt, and, but you have to know this is bigger than you. And it's not through your intention that you're not being here. It's through the purpose of protecting the, the greater good in terms of the COVID, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so call it and, and, and recognize to people that that feelings of guilt and anger and frustration that they're feeling um, is, is very normal and to be respected. Amazing. Amazing. Um, a question from Sue here, which I think is actually a really good one. How does one gear down from being hyper hyper vigilant? Mm-hmm. Um, do you know yeah, what I mean? Like, af- yeah, yeah, like after you're just like been all day, like making sure you're crossing all T's and because one thing I will say just to Sue's point, I've never been more mentally exhausted mm-hmm. than during this time period. We, I mean, I think what's clear to most people, we're not being overrun, at least in the ICU and in many parts of the hospital, but you come home gassed. Yeah. And that's because you, you, you there's so many more decisions you're making and mental processes that you're going through throughout the day. So yeah. any any suggestions on how to gear down or settle that? Well, we talked a little bit about that, but um, yeah, just to, to quiet the mind, have some time of stillness, have some time just for your own personal space and care. Um, take some time at mind, body, spirit, and recognize that th- we are running this little marathon inside of ourselves and just to take, take good care of ourselves. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that and it completely slipped my mind. Uh, it's all, it's all good. I mean, but it's the key point is to like take that time to. Well, I, I know what it was. I, it was what you were saying, Quadju. Actually, is uh, I know. I think one of the reasons I enjoy coming into work now is because uh, 
I we I we are all bonding very much so with this special time um, with our colleagues and know that we're all in the same boat. And there's you know people have this shame. Oh my God, I'm not up to speed to my professional caliber that I'm used to being because I'm I'm not really sure all the time what's happening. Um, just to recognize that we're all going through that. You know, sometimes there's that you know, with the syndrome, the, the imposter syndrome, that we're just trying to just trying to make it by, but we're really not knowing what we're doing. We do know what we're doing. It just, but we're doing it together, and we're gonna not to feel shame that we're not up to speed. And I've had conversations with families where I got off the phone now, and I'm like, oh, I'm not sure about that because <laughs> it's flipped my sense of grief and mourning upside down as well. So it's we're all learning in this together, and just take comfort in that and not to be afraid to explore those feelings with each other. I know it helps so much when I go into the palliative care office and we all just kind of talk about it and let loose and be honest and open about how it's affecting us both professionally and personally. Hmm. Find that third man, find that third. Word. Find that third. Um, I'll just read this because I'm having a tough time paraphrasing it. When you talk about searching for meaning, are you referring to mindfulness or are there other ways to search for meaning? Um, search for meaning. Uh, there, yes, there's many different ways to search for meaning. Every day, every moment of your life, you're kind of searching for meaning. But what's great about is when we have adversity that we're having, it, it gives us pause and, and a sense to really stop because we're on this treadmill all the time in life, right? We're going, we're going, we're going. And what's interesting about this pandemic of grief is it's doing actually what we need to do when we're mourning is to stop and be still a little bit and to pay attention to what's happening to ourselves physically, mentally, cognitively, spiritually. Um, it's, it's an opportunity just to kind of dig deeper into it. Again, I go back to that sense of intuition. What is it? It gives us a moment of pause and to really reflect on what is important in our lives and what isn't. And to try to kind of own that. I know I have a spiritual group that I belong to that I've kind of neglected over the last little while. And I've been uh, through Zoom, been able to link up with them a lot more. And that's been really helpful. You have to find that. Sometimes people find um, like running in nature. I love doing that. Some people, you have to find what works for you and what gives you a sense of peace and a time just to kind of pull away from everything else that you have and just to be able to be present to yourself and just to be mindful of what your what thoughts, what self-talk are you giving yourself right now? Is that self-talk harmful right now? And pay attention to that. Fantastic, Heather. Um, oh, some questions just popped up. Uh, um i think we answered that the importance of self-care all the way to the dress awesome awesome okay i'm cognizant of the time i am cognizant that um this has been an incredible session with the one and only heather busada i I'm forever in your debts because I think this is going to be so valuable to many of our listeners and to many people out there. If you, if you guys know people that are experiencing grief or loss during this time, we'll have this um, one will be uh, the podcast version or audio version will be out tomorrow and as well as the video version on YouTube. But um, Heather, I can't thank you enough. And this has been so helpful um, you're not seeing all the comments because I know you're not technically technology savvy, Ooh, but they're, they're like tremendous. <laughs> you can see them on Facebook later on after this, but um, any parting words before we go? No, I feel like I've talked enough, but all I heard was myself. So <laughs> I've talked enough. Just want to thank people for being out there and listening and um, just remember self-compassion and patience as we all move through this really challenging time together. And that's the operative word, right? Is together be interesting to see how we all come out of this, right? Uh, Hopefully for the greater good. I hope so too. Um, Thanks again, everybody. Take care, stay safe, and uh, we'll talk soon. Okay, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.